Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. So it is part two of Sean Combs, which, you know, I know that somebody had said, oh, I wish I thought you were going to talk about Monster Ball. You know, look, this thing is so long as it is. I can't take every little side track. Was Sean Combs good in Monsters Ball? Yeah. I mean, it was a small part, right? But it was definitely a pivotal part. And if he hadn't been decent for it, I don't think he would have been cast. I don't know if a lot of you know of like Halle Berry, of course, won the Academy Award for it. Um, but originally it was supposed to go to Vanessa Williams. And one of the things that I remember her specifically talking about, and I went back to um, make sure I had the quote right, because I didn't want to say, did she say that? Did she say that? And because she's been asked if she regrets turning it down. She said, well, I thought to myself, would I have won it if I'd done it? Which is a great question. You can't always say to yourself, oh, well, I would have won the Academy Award. Maybe not. Maybe you wouldn't have the chemistry with Billy Bob Thornton. Maybe it wouldn't work. She said, you can do something and not get attention or get the wrong kind of attention. And I turned it down because I had my kids and I didn't want to be bent over naked getting rammed in front of them. I mean, they've already seen her naked obviously. And she also said she just had a baby and she just didn't want to do it. Then also she said something really interesting in, uh, it was an interview that she did with Fat Joe. And she said that the team behind the movie was Harvey Weinstein. And she wasn't familiar with that crew, but believed Halle Berry had worked with them already, which kind of, hmm, are you taking a little dig in Halle? And she goes, I dodged that bullet. She said, referring to Weinstein. So does that mean that (laughs) she thought she'd have to, you know, hook up with Weinstein? Angela Bassett was also turned it down. She said, I wasn't going to be a prostitute on film. I couldn't do that because it's such a stereotype. The black, black women in sexuality. So Angela said, you know, I just wouldn't be proud of it 10 years down the road. Interesting. And then Hallie gets the, the Academy Award for it. Anyway, didn't want you to think that I didn't include it for a reason. I just, I just you know, he's just a tiny little part of it or whatever. And I think the last, when we last left, um, I was talking about Kim Porter and she said that Sean Combs and J-Lo were fake. And then I believe I talked about it. I don't even remember. About, yeah, I did talk about it because I remember saying Ibiza <laughs> about him buying drugs. And then we see Sean Combs again with this whole, I don't know, violence kind of thing that's, that's always surrounding him. And in October of 2007, he got into a fight over a woman with Stephen Acevedo and punched him in the face. Basically, Sean comes through two quick punches. And then this is, this is crazy. This, this is, uh, I get to see it. Like when I, when I tell you guys things and, you know, this is, this is from my writing, all of these articles that I talk about, you know, after November, 2006 are basically things that I wrote. But well, I guess when I write, I sometimes am writing and I also think of it as a movie. And he takes these two quick punches against Steven Acevedo. Then what he did was he dropped to the floor. Okay. And why did he drop to the floor? He dropped to the floor and crawled beneath the legs of his bodyguards until they could carry him away from the club. And then Sean Combs, when he is beneath the legs of his bodyguards, fully protected, he goes, I'm going to kill you, punk. I mean, that's such, you know, if you're going to take the punches, take them back. If you're going to, if you're going to dish them out, don't, don't hide between the legs of your bodyguards. And then, you know, I wrote that the police wanted to talk to him and to ask him with a serious face if he did really hit Osavedo. And I also wondered perhaps if it could have been a publicity stunt. One of the things, if, if you've never read it, 
there was an article in March of 2008, and it was a Los Angeles Times article. And basically, this is they reported that Sean Combs started the entire East Coast, West Coast rap war by masterminding the assault on Tupac in New York City back in 1994. You know, it was 14 years earlier. And from the time of the assault until his death, Tupac had always said that Sean Combs knew about the 1994 shooting. One of the things that, in retrospect, that you look at in this Times article is going to come out again in a few years. The sources that they used, and th they had decent sources, but if you know the, the reality of where they got their sources from, in 2008, it sounds, oh, well, this is, this is it's pretty legit reporting. But then later on, as we'll discover, the sources that the Times used, that person denied it under oath. And the Times had these sources who corroborated the story that Sean Combs was in charge of the assault on Tupac back in 1994. And then Notorious B.I.G. was also one of the people behind the assault. And Sean Combs gave a statement. He said, this story is a lie. It is beyond ridiculous and is completely false. Neither Biggie nor I had any knowledge of any attack before, during, or after it happened. Now, straight up lie, you've just been accused of an assault and masterminding an entire war where people are getting, but he didn't sue. You know, if you were ever going to file a lawsuit for libel, that was the one to do it on. Because when people read the Times article, all of a sudden millions of people all over the world can be 100% convinced that not only did Sean Combs plan the assault on Tupac, but that he also must have had something to do with his death. Diddy has always fancied himself the kingpin of his own little world, right? His own little good fellas kind of thing. We had the altercation with guns and Jennifer Lopez. We had all these beatdowns. I always think that Diddy always wanted to consider himself like a godfather, right? He hangs around Biggie, and Biggie obviously has a legit street cred. Legit. I'm shocked that he was able to pull himself out of it. I always thought of Diddy as kind of like a pompous ass. Tupac wasn't perfect. I talked about that. I talked about it in the Q&A. There are a lot of things that Tupac did which aren't perfect. Definitely had diva kind of issues. But he also didn't claim to be anyone or anything that he wasn't. And just because he didn't want to sign with Sean Combs didn't mean he need, didn't, you know, that he needed to be shot. I mean, who the hell does that? So if you take it out to the farthest point, you basically have Diddy still alive and making all the money. Well, he set the chain of events in motion that killed his alleged best friend. You know, was Biggie his best friend? I don't know. I don't think so. You know, but it got Biggie killed. It got Tupac killed. So, you know, Diddy, go ahead and, you know, make all your stupid reality shows, create celebrities out of people who are really closer to Ashley Dupree than actual celebrities. I wrote that back then because Ashley Dupree, who came up in the question and answer, I actually had written about her in that article. Diddy could keep pretending that he's this huge mogul. I mean, yeah, he had a lot of money. He's probably also looking over his shoulder all the time, which is why he's hiding between the legs of his bodyguards. The Times said, and this is where these sources, and I want you guys to remember this because I don't know if I'll get to this part or next part. But the Times said it recently obtained FBI records showing a confidential informant had implicated two New York rap figures at the time, talent manager James Jimmy Henchman Rosemond. And that's the name that's going to come up later. And promoter James Sabatino as having set up the rapper Tupac to get shot at Quad Studios. Now, Rosemond is the one that's going to go under oath later. And the Times' story linked Rosemond and Sabatino to Sean Combs, which is true. Definitely those two had connections to Sean Combs. 
And one of the things that's really interesting and what I was originally going to do with this series, and it's still going to be involved. It's just not going to be the main part of it. But my original, I don't know, not hypothesis, but you know, my thesis, the thing that I really wanted to explore was the fact that I've talked about underage sex and all these other kind of things, but in the hip hop world, we just tend to ignore it. We tend to ignore it actually in all of music world. It has nothing to do with hip hop, rock, whatever. We tend to ignore it. We just expect it to be like that for whatever reason. We don't question. When we watch Almost Famous, we just ignore the fact that they're 15 and 16 years old sleeping with rock stars. I mean, Cameron Crowe put it right out there in front of us. And we just said, oh, that's a nice movie. But Combs has all of these connections to underage sex, which we'll discover. And Rosemond was asked about them. Mike Left John, another one I was going to do. Like I said, Chris Stokes, another one. Um, there's a Jeremy Geffen, who I'm about to talk about right now, a very, very close associate of Sean Combs and D12, the manager of D12. I'm going to talk about him in a minute and his underage sex things. All of these people that are all connected, that all work together. And Rosamund and, Rosamund and Sabatino were linked to, to Sean Combs because, you know, did he want to sign Shakur? And it said that Rosamund and Sabatino helped plan the attack to punish Tupac for disrespecting them and rejecting their business overtures and not incidentally to curry favor with Sean Combs. The Times, I don't know exactly what they saw. They said they saw FBI records. The FBI had been after Rosemond for a long time. And you're going to see uh, in 2011, we're going to talk about him again. In 2013, we're going to talk about him again. He's around for a long time. The FBI, back in 2008, as we are here, we're talking about him. Basically, selling out to the FBI, talking to the FBI for five years. But in the same day that this LA Times article comes out, literally the same day, we have another story that comes out. And I do wonder, because Diddy had a statement ready for the LA Times story, if somebody didn't leak this or you know, knew that this was going to happen, it also just could be a coincidence because Jeremy Geffen had been arraigned the day before. But it kind of took the spotlight out a little bit from Sean Combs because these charges were so heinous. And Jeremy Geffen, like I said, was the manager of D12. I can't imagine that you're not familiar with them, but if you are, they're the group that launched the career of Eminem, as well as a bunch of other big names in the hip hop industry. Yes, Jeremy shares the same last name as David Geffen. Perhaps somewhere back in time, the families are related, but not close. If they had been related, this would have never happened because David Geffen would have covered it all up. But Jeremy had been arrested the Thursday prior to his arraignment. And I'm going to give the detailed details of all of his charges, but basically he was charged with sexual assault on two teenage girls, 14 felony counts, including rape, using drugs, possession of cocaine, providing cocaine to a minor, as well as two counts of unlawful sexual intercourse. <clears throat> And the crimes took place at a number of Hollywood nightclubs and also at Geffen's house. And it happened between 2006 and 2007. And he was held on a bail of $2 million. Okay, and this is serious stuff, right? These are serious charges. When you have a bail of $2 million, I want you to think about that. That's huge, especially in 2008. And if he was convicted, he faced 20 years in prison. And as I wrote back then in March of 2008, I said he won't get to spend any more time with his best friend forever, Lindsay Lohan. Because they were buddy-buddy. She probably had no idea what's going on. I mean, if you're the best friend forever, someone, would you know they used cocaine or had sex with girls as young as your little sister? And that to make sure they wanted to have sex with him because he's 35, he plied them with coke. Would you know that if they were in your intimate circle of friends and Jeremy Geffen was in Lindsay Lohan's intimate circle of friends? If you are a heavy user of cocaine, like Lindsay Lohan was, 
and someone in your inner circle had access to a bunch of Coke, would you get it from him or from some stranger? Jeremy Gaffin, I mean, 35-year-old guy hanging out with 16-year-old girls. Did it give him some kind of freakish power because they don't know how to say no? Haven't heard, you know, his crappy ass lines. With all of his money and all the coke and everything, could he not get someone who was his own age or at least legal? You couldn't find somebody in their 20s? Now, at the time I gave the benefit of the doubt that Lindsay Lohan had no idea any of this ever happened. And that she wouldn't be drawn into the case in any way other than as a name for the reporters. And I asked if she does get drawn in, though, or used as a witness, you know, like to ask some of my own questions. And you didn't really hear anything more about Jeremy Gaffin. You have all these charges in March of 2008, and you really didn't hear anything. It was like all of a sudden, like he did have David Gaffin as a relative, and it all went away. Why did it go away? And the media examined that because dude died in August of 2018. Passed away. And there was a dedicated effort to scrub his criminal record from the internet. I mean, in between the time that he was charged and in between the time he died, there was some force out there that was trying to scrub everything from the internet. He died of a drug overdose. His number one artist that he worked with, Sean Combs, D12, also Britney Spears. He led the creative rights group as president and CEO. And he founded that in 2014, which is way after all of these charges. And he got away with a lot of this and all of these artists because of what his noble goals were. Basically, he wanted artists to recapture and monetize the rights to their work, which sounds noble, right? You're helping oldies performers claim the rightful royalties. Now, he took a huge cut when he did that, but I guess these artists, better to get something than nothing was probably his selling point. Because those fights are long, they're arduous. You got to battle companies, contracts. So it seemed like he was doing a lot of good work. But Geffen's company was actively suppressing everything that had happened in his past because he wanted all of these people to come work with him. And if you Google him, you don't want to see that he had all these charges. Long before the Me Too movement. The charges basically surrounded two underage girls. These were all of the charges. Three counts of rape. One count under intimidation. Two counts of oral sex with a minor, two counts of sexual intercourse with a minor, two counts of statutory rape, two counts of inducing minors to take a controlled substance, one count of possession of cocaine, and the other of forcing a minor to consume the drug under the threat of force or violence. So take it or I'm going to kill you. One count of forced oral sex with a minor under 14. One count of oral sex on an intoxicated minor, one count of attempted sodomy with a minor, forced sexual penetration with a foreign object. Biggest client, Sean Combs. Worked with him after the charges. Britney Spears worked with him after the charges. Police had been investigating him for a year before they busted him. Because a girl came forward in October 2007. And during that investigation, like a second teenager reached out. The two victims didn't know each other. The assaults took place at different times. Somehow these underage girls, these under 14, and the other girl I think was 16, he met them at nightclubs in Hollywood. And he would offer them drugs. And his attorney at the time, a guy named Danny Davis, said, I strongly respect my client's presumption of innocence. I like to think I specialize in cases of innocent clients, and that's why I'm attracted to this case. And he pleaded not guilty. 
okay, he pleaded not guilty, but look at these witnesses we have, right? Look at all these charges. Faced over 20 years in jail, was going to have to become a registered sex offender. Instead, he accepted a plea deal with prosecutors in October of 2008. Look how quickly that got settled. There was a lot of pressure to bear from a lot of high-profile people. What did he plead down to from having to face 20 years in jail and a registered sex offender? Probation, five years. Then the charges were eventually reduced to misdemeanors. Dude had no consequences at all for raping these kids, for forcing them to do cocaine. Probation, five years, but eventually reduced to misdemeanors. And after he died, it came out that his management firm had actively scrubbed much of the news from the internet. And once he finished his probation, Geffen went after sites that featured news of the case. I went and saw if I got anything. I didn't get anything. But back in 2008, I mean, come on. It was tiny. Still not that big. But Geffen wanted to cleanse his internet tracks and public image. And do you think that maybe he wanted to, you know, the Diddy wanted to also erase it? So, oh, gosh, look who I'm working with, or Britney Spears. And Geffen's lawyer hired a third-party website to remove images and mentions of Geffen everywhere. Mentions of the sexual assault case and plea deal are difficult to find. There was like a West Hollywood News, WeHo News, on his plea deal, permanently removed, no snapshot. There's a few out there. And there was like some court paperwork and stuff still out there. Geffen never officially commented on the news. He never apologized to his victims. It doesn't even appear that they got a check. Dude just walked. Close friends, Lindsay Lohan, Sean Combs, Britney Spears. Nothing happened to him. Can you imagine if your next door neighbor had done all these things to your 14-year-old child and your 16-year-old child, and then nothing happened, literally nothing happened because of some influence of other people? Because that's what, that's what happened here. Throw a bunch of money around. And that last name, too. But that's what I'm talking about, like this whole, this culture, this whole music culture where just things go on. And I wonder if a lot of it is because it happens in clubs. It happens in nighttime and recording studios. It, it happens under the cover of a lot of secrecy. You know, film sets, even if it's a closed film set, there's a ton of people working there. If you're in a recording studio, there could be a handful of people. And we're going to go back to Sean Combs now, because I can't even think about with, with that Geffen guy. I just, I can't. I had forgotten about it until like I started researching everything. And I was like, oh my God, I forgot about this guy. And in April of 2008, we have... Diddy and Kim Porter, they're back together again. <clears throat> and basically, somehow Sean Combs convinced Kim Porter to take him back. Remember, this is after she's called relationship fake and all these people cheating and all of this kind of stuff. But she came to some kind of realization because all of a sudden in interviews, she was saying, okay. I just, I don't think that men can ever be 100% faithful. So it's okay that, that Diddy does this. Is it okay that he does it because he's paying you a lot of money and you're rich because of it? It sounds more like Sean Combs drilling that into her head for the entire 10 year relationship rather than something she necessarily personally believed. Because she did say they broke up because he was cheating. But maybe it was because he fell in love with one of them. It wasn't just about sex and having women watch him dress each night. 
I mean, who are these other women? Well, we got Sienna Miller, we got Aubrey O'Day. Would you have taken him back? We had this in April. And then in May, all of a sudden, okay, the whole taking back, where did that go? Because all of a sudden, John Combs is dating Tracy Edmonds. And I wrote in May, I go, well, did I, I, I know I drink way too much. I know I've been known to pass out short of making it to the bed, but was I out for a month or something? When did Sean Combs and Tracy Edmonds start dating? And she was running around telling everybody that they were a couple. And the last I had seen, like I said, he was dating Kim Porter again. Yes, he was in Cannes and it looked like he was having sex with some girl underneath an umbrella on the beach. And also in Cannes, he made Naomi Campbell cry. And then he sat, I, you guys, so he's in Cannes. And there's a picture of him sitting there just staring as Lindsay Lohan looks, she's back again. And Samantha Ronson make out right in front of him. He just like watched them do this. Like they were on pay-per-view or something like that. Notice how Lindsay Lohan keeps popping up into all of this. Tracy Edmonds believed that they were dating. She said, Diddy's the funniest man I've ever met. I'm so lucky to find someone so soon after Eddie. It's early days. We've only been on three or four dates, but he's whisked me off my feet. I don't know about wedding bells, but he's definitely the man for me. This was a quote. Do you know what's wrong with that quote? It sounds like it's written by knee pads. It's early days. Whenever you see it's early days, it was written by a publicist or a tabloid. It's early days. That's just ding, ding, ding. That's a red flag. I don't know about wedding bells, but he's definitely the man for me. Another ding, 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 ding. Tabloids. I mean, I understand and accept the fact there are too many people and too much gossip around the world for me to know everything or everyone. But nobody saw this. I mean, it just, it just came out of the blue. And the three or four dates, when did they happen? And nobody could figure it out. And before we could even figure it out, before we realized, okay, well, maybe Tracy Edmonds is just you know, talking out her butt or something because it just didn't make any sense. We knew that he was cheating on Kim Porter, even though they had, you know, got back together, but he had convinced her, well, you know, I just can't be faithful, but I'll make sure I take care of you and the kids. And then came along something that happened once briefly, just really, really briefly in June of 2008. And then we don't see it again for several years. And this is the fantastic thing about going back through my archives and then putting things in order by the day I wrote about them. When I'm doing the research, it doesn't necessarily come up in the order that I wrote about them. I put in a label and I, I find everything that I've ever written about somebody. And sometimes it'll come up with 2018, then it'll be 2011, 20, 2008. It's just random, right? But I put them in order because I like to tell the story as it happened. But like in 2011, I go, oh gosh, you know, I remember that. And there's two or three stories about this particular situation. And as I'm putting it together, all of a sudden there's a 2008 article and it's basically the same thing. And we didn't talk about it between 2008 and 2011. And it was just a one-off kind of thing in 2008. In June of 2008, I wrote about the fact that Cameron Diaz and Sean Combs were hooking up. I wrote about it. And I said, you know, they are hooking up. It wasn't a blind, I just said they're hooking up. And Apparently, it maybe happened after like the MTV, or well, I guess it's June, so the, the probably would have been the movie awards or whatever. And everybody, you know, they said, well, they're, they're hooking up, they're, they're having sex. They write about it, and then everybody else, everybody else starts writing about it because they dig into it more. They, they find things that I didn't. But everybody 
pretty much comes to the conclusion that they're just they're just having sex and maybe just had sex after the movie awards but with sean combs when he saw all of these reports and all of a sudden he said that he and cameron diaz are not dating well all the websites had already come to the conclusion they weren't dating we just all said that they were hooking up and having sex And basically, the gist of it was after this thing, Sean Combs and Cameron Diaz were like groping all over each other. They went back to Prince's house, of all things, and then told Prince to fire up the video camera. And then Sean Combs and Cameron Diaz made out in a room for 20 minutes. Made out, I put in quotes. I'm guessing that Diddy's probably a one-minute man. So I'm given, you know, the benefit of the doubt that the other 19 minutes were for Cameron. Do you think that maybe he like was getting undressed and then posing and stuff like that? And this was after Cameron and Justin Timberlake to kind of give you an idea, right? Their first time. And did he said, I'm just friends with Cameron. That's the same thing he said after he came out of Sienna Miller's hotel room. After being there all night. You know, he's friends with the women he sleeps with, but he's not friends with the women he has kids with. June was a big month in 2008 for finding out stuff we really didn't want to know about Sean Combs. And one of those things, was apparently that he waxes his balls and everything except the hair on his head. And he gave an interview all about it. Remember, he said, well, I'm, you know, well, I'm getting ready and I like to relax with a drink, vodka and lemonade. By the way, vodka and lemonade is, is a lovely drink. When I grew up stealing booze out of my mother's liquor cabinet and, um, because my, my dad didn't really drink really hard liquor. My dad's more of a beer guy. But my mom had hard liquor. She had gin in there. And uh, steal that gin, steal the lemonade, mix it together. I hate gin, by the way, and just because I think I had so much of it as a child. I don't think that a child, when they're learning how to drink, uh, you know, it should just stick to beer. Gin is not the drink of choice. But anyway. He would listen to some James Brown. So this sounds like basically the same story they had said before about having the ladies around. But he goes, then I'll have a manicure and a pedicure. And yes, I wax as well. Men owe it to women to make sure they're well-groomed. So he just has somebody there nonstop. Every time he's getting ready, he gets a manicure and a pedicure. Then he says that he splashes on his own cologne. One I'll talk about later that he sells in Home Shopping Network. And he splashes the cologne all over his newly waxed genitals. I don't know. Is he expecting some action down there? Does he think that the ladies are going to enjoy the poor men? Do you think they're going to enjoy the taste of the cologne in their mouth like that? I don't know. And at this time, we also learned that Sienna and Sean Combs were probably no more, right? She was the final straw in the Sean Combs breakup with Kim Porter. And then this was a golden time in Sienna Miller in the, in the blog. It just seemed like every day there was somebody new, but the main story at that time was her and Balthazar Getty. Do you guys remember that? I was writing about it all of the time. And Balthazar was under the spell of Sienna Miller and walked out on his wife and his four kids and just said, I've got to be with Sienna. Apparently Sienna wore off at some point because Balthazar did go back to his wife. But Sienna really wanted the rich guy. They met on the set of G.I. Joe. They were introduced by Matthew Reese, who also, by the way, used to have sex with Sienna. And you know, Balthazar had like an eight month old, a two year old, a four year old, I mean, really, really young, young kids. The thing is, it's one thing to, you know, 
have a relationship with Sienna Miller. It's another, you know, fine, you know, you're married, do what you want to do. But he knew, Baldazar knew that Sienna had this habit of calling in the press. She wanted to give him a fait accompli. Look, um, there's the press. Here we are. We're making out. Your hand is under my bikini top. You know? That's what she did. She assumed that because she would do that, that Balthazar would just say, well, I just can't deny my love for Sienna. It was a fitting end. You would think to the, to the Sean Combs Sienna, however, they will reenter the picture down the road. So we had Sean Combs and Cameron Diaz together in early June, mid-June of 2008, early June. And previous to that, we had Tracy Edmonds. And previous to that, we had Kim Porter and him getting back together just a few months earlier. And then in August, probably I could, we could roll dice. We could play bingo. We, I could give you a guess. You guys could sit here and guess for hours and hours and hours, and you would not guess the person that he was hooking up with in August of 2008. We just couldn't. I forgot about it, and I wrote about it. Selma Blair. Anybody see that one coming? Did not see that one coming. And Selma, at this point, she was giving a lot of interviews, and she was under the impression that all Americans were obsessed with celebrity. In 2008, that's probably true. And... She said that Americans are, that basically, even though she's American, she called us trash because we're obsessed with celebrity. But she was saying it at the same time she was promoting her latest television product. Right? And she was flying all over the world, like to Australia and America, Europe and everything, flying first class, paid for by the studio, which makes money off the same deluded Americans. And she was saying in these interviews that Americans spend far too much time worrying about celebrities in their lives when they should be focusing more on, and she didn't give any examples. What, on your TV show, which would make you a celebrity, so we should be focusing on you? And Selma was the same woman who a week earlier had said she wanted to try acid, even though she went to rehab a month earlier. She said that Americans should try and live by her example of how to live the perfect life. What? I, you know, the thing I hate most is hypocrisy, right? I hate when celebrities knock the very thing that got them to where they were. Did she think that she's the world's greatest actress? Why do you think that she gets roles? Because people, you know, assume she's some kind of celebrity. That's why people are hiring her. You know, and she's not very good at marketing herself, which is why she didn't get a ton of work. Look at Jennifer Aniston. Look at Jessica Biel, Jessica Alba. They know how to promote. Not great actresses, but they know how to promote. And Selma Blair was out there trying to promote, which, by the way, makes you a celebrity. This was her quote. Everyone here is obsessed with tabloid celebrities and their lives and wanting to be like that. In America, you have the people who watch the Lohan's reality show and want to be like Dina and Ali Lohan and live in a house with the throne in it everywhere. They're just everywhere. I think she was a little bit jealous. And what made me write about this, other than the fact that I thought it was super bizarre that she and Sean Combs were a couple, is this. She wanted the world to know that she and Sean Combs were together and called the paparazzi to take pictures of her with Sean Combs while they're walking the beach hand in hand. She's the one who called. The same person who was trashing celebrity. Her. She was the one who was doing it. And I hate that kind of thing. You know what else I hate? I hate this. I hate somebody like Sean Combs who's like, that whole thing that I talked about in the last episode with the 1800 tequila and if I can't find it and just throwing a hissy fit and whining and just like, like nothing else is going to be good enough. I can't drink any other kind of tequila because I am Sean Combs.
don't forget 2008. The like gas prices were out of control. Like, like the same kind of out of control that they were last year. But even more so because they were about the same price, but in 2008, the, the dollar didn't go as far. Right? So it was more expensive. And he was complaining about the fact that he couldn't afford to fly on his private jet anymore. That he just, he couldn't, he just couldn't afford it anymore. So that he had to start flying commercial. And that he hated it. And that he, the reason he hated it is because he had to go to the airport and see regular people. Even though he was going to the first class club and stuff, he did not like being on an airline with regular people. He thought he was above that and beyond that. He didn't like the fact that he had to sit next to somebody on an airplane that was a regular person. He didn't like the fact that he had to eat airline food. I mean, that's what makes people hate celebrities. I had to go to the airport. Oh my gosh, I couldn't handle going to the airport. There was all these people there, all these regular people. At what point do you become the kind of person who's just like, they're not good enough for me? That's what I hate. You know what I like to see? I like to see celebrities at the airport. I like to see them in the airline clubs. I just like to, you know, they can still be jerks, but at least they're there. But just to complain about, oh, to hating to have to be with, these are the same people that you want to buy your records, that want to buy your movies and stuff. And then you act like this and it is horrible. At the beginning of this episode, we talked about Sean Combs, like punching a guy, right? And then hiding out under his bodyguard's legs. In the last episode, I talked about all this violence that, you know, he was a part of. In February 2009, there was another gun. You would think that after the 1999 thing that perhaps there would be no more guns in Sean Combs' life. There was a party that Sean Combs co-hosted with Kobe Bryant, RIP, in February of 2009. And at this party, the police basically raided it. And they had a question. Sean Combs refused to allow himself and his bodyguards to be searched by the NYPD at this party. Everybody else at the party, including Kobe Bryant, gave permission for the search for weapons. Basically, this was the deal. It was a Monday night because everybody knows Monday night's a big party night. And Sean Combs and Kobe were supposed to host a birthday party for DJ Clue. The party was going to be filled with NBA players. I'm assuming, judging by the date of February 4th, that it was probably All-Star Monday, so the game had probably been the day before. That's what I'm guessing. But because it was going to be filled with NBA players, the NBA knew this, and the venue and the NBA had basically arranged for NYPD officers to search every person who came in the door for guns, right? That's just smart. They wanted everyone to be safe. They weren't security guys. They were actual police. They weren't looking for drugs. They just wanted to see if you had a gun. Well, Diddy rolls up about 2 a.m. First of all, if you're hosting the party, co-hosting the party, and you're not showing up until 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not much of a co-host. It just shows what a lack of respect you have if you are a co-host. But he shows up at 2 a.m. with six of his bodyguards and see what's happening, and he freaks out. Why? Why are you freaking out? Are you telling me that you still have all your bodyguards and everybody carrying guns after what happened before? So he's the bodyguards and they're at the door and he sends one of the guards back to the car to stay there and not leave, probably also carrying some guns. And then did he try to talk his way past the search when he was told everyone had to be searched? He then tried to avoid it by going around the back and seeing if he could use the back entrance. Nope, there was cops there too. 
they kind of figured out that maybe somebody would try to do that. So despite the fact that he was co-hosting the party and didn't even bother to show up until o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, he just left. Why couldn't he be searched? Could he not pass off his gun? Was he really going to carry a gun in there? Were all the bodyguards going to carry guns in there, despite the fact of what had happened 10 years earlier? Why couldn't they be searched? He said he felt disrespected. What? Why are you disrespected? These are NBA players. Kobe Bryant. Everyone else who came to the party was searched, but because you're Sean Combs, you're above it all? Better than all these NBA players? Better than Kobe Bryant? Diddy has been and always will be a jerk. He has always acted as if the law doesn't apply to him. Always. Go back to the first part. Now this part, he feels the same way from 1991 to 2009. The law doesn't apply to him. What did he have on him that he was willing to disrespect his other co-host and all the guests by turning his back on the search? Did Kobe Bryant get searched? Yes. And you know what? I didn't like Kobe Bryant then. But he accepted it because he knew it was for his own safety. And you know what? He didn't have a gun. He didn't care. Did all the other NBA stars get searched? Yes. And remember, these are all-star NBA players. These are all A-listers. They didn't have a problem with it. So why did Diddy think that he was more important than them? Why? He just, he attracts this kind of thing. I just don't understand why he didn't want to be searched. What were they all hiding? And why do you need to bring guns if everybody else doesn't have a gun? You know why? Because he's afraid he's going to say something, get punched, and he's afraid to get punched, and he wants his bodyguards there to pull out guns like they did back in 1999. That's what he wants. Because he thinks having six bodyguards, when you're going to an NBA party, he thinks it makes him look tough. There is nothing tough about Sean Combs. He hides behind a facade of toughness. Do you think he would go one-on-one with Suge Knight? Suge Knight's an a-hole and a jerk. But you know what? Suge Knight's tough. Suge Knight's not going to back down. And Suge Knight probably doesn't need six bodyguards. He'll just go ahead and pull out his own gun and shoot you. February 2009 was big, right? It was big. We had that. Wasn't as big. But what happened in February 2009? One of the biggest stories in all of gossip history happened in 2009 in February. And it's crazy. That is the that is the month. You know, Chris Brown, Rihanna the beating, right? It's just like, but what we saw, there was so much back and forth. There was so much confusion after that happened. And then somehow Rihanna and Chris Brown ended up back together by the end of the month, right? We had Grammys and then all of a sudden they're back together. And the place that they stayed at was Sean Combs house. He told them that they just needed to work it out, that they were too big of stars, that they couldn't possibly be separated. They just needed to work it out. And he was going to give them the house. And not to leave the house until they worked it out. I don't think he cared about Rihanna. He wanted that Chris Brown money. Because Chris Brown was huge then, right? And now all of a sudden we have radio stations who promised that they would never, ever play his music again. The world promised they wouldn't buy his records again. And Sean Combs knew this. So he told Rihanna, you got to take him back. You got to take him back. You got to take him back. Because once you take him back, then the radio stations will start playing everything again. People will start buying his records. They'll go to his shows. She was out of there. She was gone. She had moved on. But no, she took him back. You know, I mean, he just was like, he just really didn't expect that. 
And Sean Combs was looking out for himself. He, he didn't care about Rihanna. He didn't care about Chris Brown. He just wanted everything that he could out of this situation. Chris Brown would be grateful. You know, make some money together or whatever. Sean Combs is always looking out for himself. He never looks out for anybody else. Ever. I haven't really talked about Kim Porter didn't die until 2018 or whatever. And we'll get to that. But if you guys are interested, I, I did do a Kim Porter episode when she died and it's going to be way, way, way back. And I didn't get the number. And there's a lot of wild speculation in that episode. But I, I never got the feeling that, that Sean Combs wanted to take care of her. Didn't, you know, just basically let her wither away and die. And then afterwards, when she dies, the crocodile tears. And oh my gosh, I've always loved her. No, you love yourself. In the next episode that we do with Sean Combs, the first thing that we're going to talk about is Sean Combs calling Aubrey O'Day a hooker. That's a good way to begin and end. I'll talk to you guys later.